a warning before starting. I would like to uh, note that uh, the exercise today is not to accuse or blame anyone individually. Some people could feel perhaps a little uh, uncomfortable with certain aspects of my presentation. But let me reassure you that I do not have the intention to point uh, to point anybody uh, out. I know many people who work at the federal and provincial level, and I know they do good work, and that often they are stuck with decisions that are not their own. So, as we say in English, please don't take it personally. So now, let's get to the heart of the matter and look at... Uh, the concrete case of a disabled person who used the mechanisms at her disposal to get uh, to to get her rights to access. So this is uh, Donna Jordan, who you can see here. She looks like she's quite happy, and that's quite normal because she just won in court. To, uh, that's when this picture was taken. So she lives in Toronto, and she is uh, legally blind. So according to her testimony, after years uh, of having no access to certain key websites for the federal government, so we're talking about Services Canada, Stats Canada, the Commission of uh, Public uh, Servants, well, after after failing to gain uh, access access to these websites after going to the uh, Human Rights Tribunal and after negotiations that led nowhere, she got fed up and decided to take the federal government to court in 2007. So Mrs. Jordan is represented by the Toronto Forum Baker Law, and she presented several proof or elements. So reports from the uh, United Nations and the European Commission who looked at websites throughout the world and, and who concluded that less than 20% of the websites in Canada met basic requirements when it comes to accessibility. So you've got to go back a few years, remember this. Um, so Canadian reports when it comes to the conformity of uh, Canadian websites. And there was an internal verification audit that was done in 2007 that concluded that close to 50% of the ministries and agencies that were subject to federal standards of accessibility did not implement these standards in an appropriate manner. And in fact, there was, uh, in in the elements that were presented, a report that was done by Accessibility Web during its uh, triannual uh, report in 2007, if I'm not mistaken. There were also examples that were given by Mrs. Jordan, um, examples of the obstacles that she met when she was using these websites and what effect they might have on her independence. And also expert testimony in her favor, including Mrs. Hugh Tachiranis, whom you probably know quite well. And she's considered really an expert when it comes to digital accessibility, not only in Canada, but on the international scene as well. She was very involved in the development of standards at the W3C. The government produced about 12 testimonies, two experts, people that are well known as well, Cynthia Waddell and Chuck Letourneau, and about 10 government employees. But overall, the government did not manage to convince the judge that a blind person would not have difficulty with the cited government websites. So, at the heart of this whole story, well, the issue was, we had to find out, if the federal government had, if they if they had respected her rights, or right, her rights that are guaranteed by Article 15 of the Canadian Church of Human Rights, and more specifically, was her right to equality uh, trampled upon because the federal government either established accessibility standards that are inadequate or because it didn't implement and apply the existing standards. Now, this was uh, this case was heard last September in record time, and the judge came up with the decision in November, so only two months later, in November of 2010, and the judgment uh, was in Mrs. Jodan's favor. The judge was quite severe. He concluded that, in fact, the standards of the federal government were inadequate at the time, and you have to remember that this is several years back, so it's not necessarily the case today, but at the time, the judge concluded that these standards were inadequate and that, in addition, they were not applied in many cases and that the federal government was conscious of these difficulties. And the judge also reminded us that in terms of reasonable accommodation, because when we're talking about equality and rights and discrimination, 
mission when we're talking about reasonable accommodation. While the government has the obligation, the judge said that the government has the obligation to take reasonable means to adaptation to guarantee that members of marginalized groups have the rights to the same benefits of government services. Now, it, the judge said that when it comes to blind people, because this was a case for only the visually impaired, but we can also think of all disabled pe people. So the standard of accessibility for the federal government already constitutes a means of um, a reasonable adaptation. The judge also said that the federal government did not try to justify why these norms or standards were not applied, for example, by giving a reason like a, that the cost of their application would bring about excessive constraints or that it wasn't technically feasible to apply them. And in fact, one of the, one of the main defenses offered by the government was that we had offered Mrs. Jodan uh, an alternative way to consult the information or to access online services uh, where uh, you know by phone or in person so I'm, I'm giving you a, a, a very brief resume of, of what's happened I could I but because I don't have much time but I think that I can still I think that I can say that in 2010 when this case was heard in court or even in 2007 when the when the complaint was filed well this type of argument is no longer valid so, not only did Judge Kellen find that there was discrimination, but he also recognized that the incapacity, uh, the, the fact that she could not have access to certain government services was revealed a systemic failure. So it was quite severe as a comment. And the judge has also said that the government had the obligation to conform to the chart in a reasonable delay, that is, in, within 15 months, and uh, obviously, we can well imagine that this may not be reasonable in 15 months to to make millions and millions of web pages accessible, but that's what the judge decided. The judge is still overlooking this until the judgment is executed, so he's got a right of supervision in 15 months. Well, now we're further than that, but at the end of the 15-month delay, he will look again uh, to see where the federal government, what kind of what kind of progress the federal government has made with regards to this judgment. And he, finally, he gave uh, Mrs. Jonah $150,000. So I won't get into uh, greater details because not only is the judgment available online, but it also received a lot of attention in the media. And in the blogosphere, you have no idea. But I would, I will only say that yes, the judgment may not be perfect, but it certainly constitutes a very significant development when it comes to the rights of people and of disabled people in Canada. Furthermore, this judgment sends a clear message to other governments within the country, a message that says, hey, guess what? The status quo is no longer valid. Ignoring the rights of disabled people is not right. And if you do, you will be brought to court and get ready to lose. Obviously, this is not the end of the story because while a lot of people were fighting over this judgment, well, the government had already decided to go to the appeals court in uh, December of 2010. So they asked for a reconsideration. It, it was not an appeal, but it was a request to correct certain technical errors in the judgment. In, in last February, the Judge Cullen uh, listened to the government's motion, modified his initial judgment when it came to the number of ministries and agencies. So uh, initially, he had said that it was 146 ministries that were subjected to federal standards, but in fact, it was really 101. So this correction was made. And but even though he maintained that the government failed to apply its own standards, he consented to the exception when it came to archived content. And that is where, in my opinion, there was one of the biggest issues. I know that there are a lot of people here who don't agree with me, but that's OK. 
Furthermore, in addition to this reconsideration request, the government also um, filed for an appeal at the end of December in which they, they want to fight the entire judgment. The parties had until May to uh, submit their arguments and proof and evidence, and a new, um, and a new case will be heard at the, in the fall of uh, 2011. So a lot of people were quite shocked by the stubbornness of the government, the money and the energy um, spent uh, disturbs a lot of people. And it goes without saying that a lot of people here in Quebec, notably within the provincial government, a lot of people were very interested to see how this would uh, turn out. And that brings me to speak to you of the situation here in Quebec. I was saying earlier when I started that the standard of accessibility in Quebec that we call the it's GQRE 00, right? That's only one piece of the puzzle, and that's true. In fact, in Quebec, the reality is that there are many legal and political mechanisms concerning disabled people. And even when it comes to the relatively new question of the of access to technology and uh, digitized content, unfortunately, I don't have uh, the time to look at all of this because there are several of them. But I will look quickly at three of them, three tools that disabled persons may use. So quickly, in Quebec, we've got a law specifically for the rights of uh, disabled people, etc., etc. Et it's a very long title. But anyways, this was adopted initially in 1978 and was one of the first laws in the world that, that uh, recognized the rights of disabled people. In 2004, this law was revised, and the revision had requirements that directly or indirectly concern access to technology and digitized uh, content. Uh, in particular, Article 26.5 that requires that the government of Quebec gives access to services and information in digital form as well. This article uh, led to the adoption of a policy and to the standards that are now in place that have uh, technical requirements. I will not get into uh, the, the standards here in Quebec. We've talked about it enough today, but I will talk about the policy on access to documents and services. Now, the first objective of this policy is to allow disabled people to have access in all equality to the services and documents offered to the public. There are two uh, components and six objectives, including the one that um, there should be communication means that are adapted to the needs of the people. Now, the policy insists on the notion of reasonable accommodation, which, like I said earlier, is a natural consequence of the right to equality. We are also talking about the idea, according to which, that identity of treatment does not equal equality of treatment. In other words, the right to equality for a person who is in a different situation than the majority may require different accommodations. But in the spirit of the obligation to accommodate does not have an absolute character, we would say that accommodation has to be reasonable. That is, that we cannot impose excessive constraints. And there, the policy reminds us that we need more than negligible um, efforts to meet these needs, especially when it comes to cost. And like a representative of the Commission of the, Commission of the Human Rights uh, said earlier, it has to hurt. You have to prove that really this constitutes a constraint that you cannot that you cannot uh, shoulder. Now, finally, a word on the most important law in Quebec when it comes to rights and liberties. So the the provincial chart, which was adopted in 1975 and uh, was put into effect in 1976. So the provincial chart is a fundamental law because, in principle, no disposition of another law can be contrary to the rights that are outlined in it. So the fundamental rights, political rights, judicial rights, and the right to equality. So concretely, the chart recognizes a set of rights and liberties. And as you can see here on the slide, just about everybody from the government to individuals to companies, etc., is subject to the obligations contained in the chart. This is in Article 10 that we talk about the right to equality and that we recognize that all people has a right to recognition and to the exercise of all these rights in full equality without distinction, etc., on race, religion, uh, sex, or disabilities. So I won't spend too much time on this resource. I'm, I'm sure that you're already familiar with the chart. Well, I hope so anyways, if only to say that it's only recently that we've started to use the chart in Quebec for questions of disabilities 
um, in link with technology. Traditionally, in Quebec, in matters of communication, the chart was mostly used to, for, for, for example, to have access to Braille. But in the past year, complaints were submitted to the Commission of the Rights of People or Human Rights when it comes to, uh, you know, the little interact machines and businesses and stuff. There are still some people who believe that a case like the Jordan case cannot happen here in Quebec. There are other people who believe that the adoption of the accessibility standards fix everything. But as we've seen very recently, despite Despite the standards, the government of Quebec is not uh, can still uh, be guilty of producing uh, websites where there are accessibility problems. So, uh, for example, here there was a big consultation that was done online by the government of Quebec in this initiative under Henri Francois Gautrin wanted to explore how the government of Quebec can exploit the web to improve the quality of services to citizens and its uh, internal efficacy. And now, if we go to the bottom of the page and you click on the uh, accessibility policy, and now we're talking about a new website, we find this declaration. This this internet platform does not conform to the, to the Quebec government standards of accessibility. A, con a government c consultation that uses a platform that does not conform to its own standards. So it's got accessible and known accessibility problems. Now, representations were made, manifestations were made by, by a, a group defending the rights of blind uh, people, and all they said to them was that it would be noted in the final report. But I think that we will probably see disabled people who will we use the mechanisms at their disposal, including the chart of rights, to gain right to, um, to num num uh, digitize content. You know, we saw this at the federal level. It wasn't just a question of knowing, well, was a standard applied, but was the standard adequate? Mrs. Jordan showed uh, the example, and uh, people took notice. So to conclude, I'd like to uh, to say to you, accessibility is not simply a question of satisfying points of control. Now, we've all heard this, right? And in fact, accessibility is much more than that. And as you may have seen, accessibility is a right. I urge you to look at it in this way in your work and to look further than the technical requirements they have to meet. I invite you to consider accessibility in your work as a contribution to the actualization of the rights of a community, disabled people, but ultimately the rights of all. Thank you.